Okay, so I'm not, I don't really have an introductory slide, but I'll introduce myself. I'm Lisa Randall, professor of physics at Harvard. I do particle physics and cosmology. And um, I'm going to give a slightly different perspective than Zhao has just given. Um, I'm going to give some of the more conventional view. Like, I'm very sympathetic to the point of view that we don't understand everything yet. Um, but I'm also very sympathetic to the fact that we should really pay attention to observations. And so I don't have time to go into everything, but I'm going to try to explain to you why we believe what we believe about cosmology. But I will start by saying the one thing I very much am sympathetic to is that everyone knows about the so-called Big Bang Theory, but the one thing we really don't know is what banged. We don't know the beginning. The Big Bang Theory is really a theory of how the universe has evolved later, and that is something we can measure. So let me just um, tell you a little bit about the kinds of things that we, we know and don't know about the universe. Okay. okay, so what are the questions we're asking? Well, I do particle physics, so I'm interested not just in the cosmology of the universe as a whole, but also what is stuff really made of? What is it that's essentially there? So we're interested in the stuff we see, but we're also interested in the dark stuff, like dark matter and dark energy, which not only do I believe is there, I really see no reason they shouldn't be there. And so the, the one place, another place that I might disagree slightly is I'm still coming at it from the perspective that we are pretty random, that humans are not essential to the universe, but I do think that we often in, in science make the mistake of thinking everything we see is all there is. Even though we've been taught this many times, and of course everyone knows about the Galilean revolution, dark matter is not such a mysterious thing, but it is mysterious to us because we're not made of it and we don't see it. But dark matter is just matter that's out there that doesn't interact with light. And we make an assumption that everything should be like our stuff. We should be able to see it, everything. Everything should interact with photons, with light, and that's not necessarily true. So there can be dark matter in the universe. There can also be dark energy. Energy, dark energy is just energy not even carried by matter. It's just energy that's out there, and it influences the expansion of the universe. And there's no reason these shouldn't be there. In fact, the mystery about dark energy is not why it's there but why there's so little of it? Why is the amount so little compared to what we'll see and what, c compared to what we would expect? Okay. Of course, another question is how did the universe evolve to its current state? As Zhao pointed out, we don't have a static universe. Our universe is evolving. And as it evolved, a lot of structure formed. So how did this happen? This is one of the really interesting questions. And it is a question that does ultimately connect to life on Earth. Life on Earth doesn't necessarily connect to how the universe evolved, but a lot of how it evolved is essential to how our life came into being, and I'll mention a couple of ways. And of course, the other question, which we both have, is how much can you explain of all of this? Okay. So I'm just going to say particle physics goals are to understand matter's most basic interactions. And I don't have time to go into all of this, but the idea is that at every scale, the, what scale we look at things matters. And when we can see at smaller scales, when we have more technology, we can see smaller scales and find out more about what's there. So we know that we're, I'm standing on a floor, but that floor is ultimately made of atoms. Those atoms are actually mostly empty space because they have pr nuclei surrounded by electrons much further away. Now, of course, it doesn't seem like empty space, and that's because we're not probing at the scale of an atom when I'm looking around. I see visible light, and I don't see those scales. But when we have the tools to look at atomic scales, we find out such things. We want to know the connection to underlying theoretical frameworks, deeper understanding of space-time, and we want to know the connections to cosmology, which I'll talk more about later. And the only point I wanted to make here is that a lot of things that we see are not into, a lot of what we find out about the universe and a lot of what we find out about particle physics scales are not intuitive. And the reason it's not intuitive is we see at certain length scales. We basically see with our eyes from about a millimeter to maybe a kilometer if we're lucky. We don't see, we don't see these tiny scales. So they're not the ones we're used to. We don't see on atomic scales. We don't see on cosmological scales. So we have to rely on measurements to tell us what's actually going on. Of course, we can both theorize. We're both theoretical physicists. But then ultimately, you want to test those theories with measurements. So this is just to give you some idea of the scale of the universe. Um, we saw a picture of the solar system earlier. The solar system is, is over here, 10 to the 13th meters. Notice I'm measuring everything in terms of a human scale. Humans are about two meters big, right? 
it's not a coincidence we use meter. It's, it's very human scale. It's like the scale of your arm. And how big are things compared to that? Well, the universe is 10 times itself 27 times bigger than that. And by, I mean, you might say, why is it even a finite scale? Well, I'm talking about the scale we can see. If we believe the universe existed 13.8 billion years and the speed of light is finite, we can only see out a finite distance into the universe. There can be stuff beyond that, but it's not stuff we can see. So that is not accessible to observation. It is something we can just purely speculate and theorize about. Um, and then within that universe, there's all sorts of different scales. There's a scale of the universe w which was smaller when the cosmic microwave back when we just heard about was emitted. There's a scale of galaxies, 10 to the 20th meters, scale of the solar system, which I mentioned, and down here we have a human scale. And the same laws of physics apply in all these scales. We use general relativity and electromagnetic, and we can figure out what's going on. And this is the same slide you saw earlier, because we all have to show it. <laughs> um, but just to remind you, this back before, and I agree, before this point, it's much harder to subject the universe to observations. It's not impossible, but it's much harder. The CMB is a really valuable resource because it allows the cosmic microwave background, it allows us to do precision measurements. The light comes directly at us from that time. So when we look at this cosmic microwave background radiation, that three degree radiation we see today, and we can look back at the time at which it was emitted, we really do learn about what the universe was like before the time when structure formed, before the time when galaxies formed, before the time when galaxy clusters, any, any structure. It was just a largely homogeneous universe with tiny fluctuations that eventually developed into everything we see. So you don't have to understand all the complicated mess of the evolution. You can look back to this very clean time to measure what the universe was made of at that time. Um, earlier than that, we believe, or many people believe, Zhao doesn't believe, but many people believe that the universe had a phase of exponential expansion known as inflation, okay? After which something called the Big Bang Theory took over. So the Big Bang Theory is a smooth evolution. We just have this very nice, we, we know, given the matter, given the radiation of, in the universe, we can figure out how it evolves, how it expands. Earlier on, it seems there was this enormous amount of energy that drove in an exponential expansion. So sort of this explosive phase of expansion, and then this nice slow, slower phase, and which we're still in today. And there's many things that happen since the time of, the, of this, that this radiation was emitted. Um, there was actually nothing emitted light. Before then, there was light, and after there was light. But here, there's, it's dominated by dark stuff, but eventually, stars start to form, and those are burning lights through nuclear energy. So we have this dark, and then we have the development of galaxies and planets. And we, in the period today, we have, again, a phase of accelerated expansion due to dark energy, which is something we don't understand very well. But in this stage, we do understand a lot of what's going on. And we understand the role that dark matter played in the development of all this structure. It's really very exciting. So this again says more or less the same thing. So for the interest of time, I'm going to go on. So let me just say, one of the many surprises that we have, in some sense, is that so much of the universe is stuff that we're not made of. The atoms, atoms is basically what we're made of. It's normal matter. Then there's about five times the amount of the energy in the universe is this stuff called dark matter. That means that of the matter we see in the universe, about a sixth of it is the stuff that we're made of, and about five sixths is dark matter. Now you might say, how could that be? Why should that be? I mean, to my mind, it's much more surprising that we are as much as one sixth of all the matter in the universe. I mean, we're just pretty random. I mean, the fact that we're comparable to dark matter, I actually find very interesting the fact that matter and dark matter are comparable energies. And also the fact that it's comparable in energy to dark energy. I mean, if you think of this as a pie, and someone offered you any of these slices of pie, you would still be able to get some pie. <laughs> if, it had been, if these had been very different, you wouldn't even see those other slices. So it's really interesting that there's a comparable amount of dark matter, dark energy, and ordinary matter. And it's one thing that might help us eventually understand what the, where these other things come from. And this just says the same thing. Um, one other interesting thing I'm going to say, though, just to leave you with one other kind of interesting question, is everyone knows we don't fully understand dark matter and dark energy. At some level, we don't even understand ordinary matter. Why do I say that? 
Well, we know what it's made of. I'm a particle physicist. We've understood a lot of stuff of what atoms are made of, what about quarks and leptons and particles. But what we don't really know is why there's more matter than antimatter. If that had not been true, all the matter in the universe would have annihilated with itself, and it would be left at nothing. So at some stage in the universe, some stage in the evolution of the universe, we had to have formed more matter than antimatter. And how that came about is, again, one of the major questions that we ask ourselves. And there are proposed solutions, but we don't know which one is right. So really, it's fair to say we don't understand any of these pieces of the pie as much as we would like to. And just to prove that there is dark matter, and we can debate later whether or not this is proof, but I just want to give you a couple of ways that why we think there is dark matter. Um, one is the cosmic microwave background, which we can measure extremely accurately. So there really are many different ways. There's also stars' rotation in, in galaxies. If there wasn't dark matter, they would just be flying off. There wouldn't be enough matter to keep them gravitationally bound. But this, this is one of the, I like this one because it's one of the more direct ways in some sense. And it's called gravitational lensing. So suppose you were sitting here on Earth at your telescope or whatever you had. And there's some object that emits light back here. So there is an object that emits light. It's, that's not the dark object. But there's some dark object in between. Say it's a galaxy that has a lot of dark matter in it. So there's something in between that's dark. So it's not emitting light. It's not absorbing light. It's not reflecting light. The only thing that it does in the way it interacts with light is through gravity. And so it can gravitationally bend some light that gets emitted. So light is happily going along. And then, it's, then this galaxy is there, and the light bends around it. But as you can see, which way it bends depends on whether it came from this direction or that direction. And we're just sitting here. We're completely innocent. We don't know there's anything dark there. So we think, what did we see? Well, we think we saw the object over here from this light, because we project it back. And we think we saw the object over there from that light. So we see two copies, or multiple copies, of that same star. So even though we don't see the dark object, the fact that we see multiple images of something that did emit light tells us that there was something dark in between. So just the gravitational influence, that's why we know about dark matter because of its gravitational influence. And this is even a more profound way that sort of really tells us it's really dark matter. What this is is something very famous now known as the bullet cluster. So you have two ga galaxy clusters, which are big groups of many galaxies, that merge together. And what happens when they merge together is really interesting. Because a galaxy cluster has both, it has stars, it has gas, and it has dark matter in it. When these two things merge, the gas interacts with itself. So it's like you're in a traffic jam. The two interact, and they don't go through. So in the center, you get a lot of gas. However, the dark matter doesn't interact with either the gas or with itself very much, and it goes through. So you see this very different physical behavior, depending on whether it's something that's interacting, like gas, or whether it's something that's not interacting, like dark matter. So it's really very concrete evidence that there's stuff there that's just getting through and that's not interacting, which is what we mean by dark matter. What is it? We don't know. We have many candidate possibilities for what it is. What we mean by what it is is we'd like to know, is it a particle? Does it have a mass? How does it interact? Does some of it interact? Is it one thing? There's many different questions we have about dark matter. So I'll tell you about my current research if you ask me any questions. And I just want to say, since I know that this, this series has been a lot about life and structure, that I just want to say that dark matter was essential to the structure in the universe. In fact, because dark matter is most of the stuff, it collapsed first. Also, because it doesn't interact, you can imagine if stuff collapses and there's radiation, it would sort of drive it outward. Because dark matter doesn't have this radiation, <laughs> it collapses and then ordinary matter collapses in, with it too. If there hadn't been dark matter, structures on the side of galaxies couldn't have formed because it just would have been driven out by its radiation. So dark matter is essential for the structure we see today that formed in the lifetime of the universe, and therefore it's essential to our galaxy and all the stuff within it, including the solar system and the planets. I'll just mention, just again, because I've been asked to mention just ideas of life, I want to say that it is pretty interesting that everything around us did allow life to form. I'm not going to make a grander statement like this is the only way life can form or we're the only form of life, 
But there are things that had to happen to have life form as we know it. We had to live in a galactic habitable zone protected from asteroids and cosmic rays. We had to be in a place that were relatively shielded from all the stuff that would have destroyed life. Carbon and oxygen had to be created, and they're created in supernova. They're actually created in stars, these complex elements which are essential to life. Hydrogen was there early on, but carbon and oxygen only got formed once stars formed and supernova formed and they exploded. Um, carbon is not just necessary for life. After all, we're all carbon-based life. It's also necessary for the stability of the climate. If we didn't, I mean, we all know about global warming, but if we didn't have carbon in the atmosphere and water in the atmosphere, we actually wouldn't have liquid water on Earth. We actually need it to keep, to keep things um, warmer. Water and organic matter is common in our environment, and the planet is in a habitable zone that supports water. So all these things were essential to our life forming. I don't know how essential they are to life in general, but it is amazing how over this 13.8 billion years, we managed to form the things our solar system formed about four and a half billion years ago, and then we came to form. Okay. So because I'm a particle physicist, how are we doing on time? I would like to say a few words about particle physics, but I don't want to take up all the available time. Do you, should, can I say a few words about particle physics? I will take that as a yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to mention um, that I talked about large scales, but small scales are also important. Okay. So here we have the human being at the top, at the top of the chart here. And I just want to say that um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I just, I just want to say that every one of these stages, if we didn't have observations, we wouldn't have known about it. We wouldn't guess what's inside matter correctly. We, we certainly wouldn't have guessed if quantum mechanics existed and people hadn't seen mysterious properties of the atom. We wouldn't have even known about DNA if we hadn't done X-ray diffraction to see its structure. It really, every one of these came along with some technological tool. And the major technological tool we have today is something called the Large Hadron Collider. It's, um, it's this very big ring in Geneva that, where they collide together protons, and you might have heard about the Higgs boson discovery that happened there. And, um, and they're still looking to find more things, which I can tell you about, but I'm going to rush through a lot of this now, but you can ask about it during questions. And again, I just want to emphasize that all of this is to get into the hidden structure. Every scale, time we examine a new scale, we can find out something qualitatively different about what we're made of, but all those things are essential to the way our life works. That's understanding the standard model of particle physics, which involves particles called quarks, like the up and down quark inside protons and neutrons, and objects like electrons, and the three copies of them. And the frontier energy scale is the one at, at the Large Hadron Collider. And again, I'm going to just rush through this because I don't want to, I'm going to skip this. But you can ask me about it later. What are we going to learn there? We're going to, we learned already a lot about how elementary particles acquire their mass with the discovery of something called the Higgs boson. Hopefully we'll learn what explains the weakness of gravity. Gravity won't seem like a strong force, but you have the entire Earth acting on you. From the point of view of elementary particles, gravity is like 40 orders of magnitude smaller in strength than force of electromagnetism. Why is gravity as weak as it is? And the answer to that question is essential for the consistency of the standard model and it could require something as exotic as more symmetry or even an extra dimension. There's also some hope that we'll understand dark matter at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and so I will mention just very briefly the idea that one of the hopes we have is of discovering something at the Large Hadron Collider is an extra dimension of space. Something beyond the three we see, it's not something that we can picture. This would be an entire electron itself, but it could be that there's another dimension. I mean, again, the history of physics is every time we looked at smaller scales, every time we looked at places we hadn't seen before, we found things that we didn't know. And the only way to know whether or not this extra dimension exists is to entertain the possibility and say, what could we see if it were true? And what we could see, I'm going to skip all this, sorry. Sorry about that. I'm just, what we could see is when we collide together protons, we can actually make something called the kaluza klein particle, a particle that travels in extra dimensions that could actually decay in the detector and be found the way all other particles would. It would be incredibly exciting. So I'm just going to have one final stage where I'm going to say not only is large scale structure essential for life, actually the properties of, of small scale things seem also to be at least essential, again, to life as we know it. It turns out that if you didn't have the Higgs mass be what it is and the light quark masses and the electron mass, either hydrogen would be unstable or 
that relative ratio of hydrogen and helium would be wrong and we wouldn't have complex nuclei the way we know they exist. So even particle physics parameters, again, seem essential to life as we know it. Again, I don't want to make any deeper statement. It could be there could be other life based on other types of parameters, but it does seem amazing how the life we know relies so strongly on these amazing things that we're discovering about the universe. <laughs>